And as you know, tonight, Sunday, September 13th, our topic is the sticks of Judah and Joseph, two witnesses for the Messiah. That topic was selected primarily to give background for the subsequent three discussions which will have to do with Israel. And on Sunday, October 4th, in this same building at this same time, the subject will be Israel Yesterday, the Origin and History of the House of Israel. And in that lecture, we will discuss, among other things, some of the beliefs, customs, practices, and traditions of ancient Israel, and essentially will trace the origin of his Israel from its beginning here on the earth down to modern times. On Sunday, November 1st, again in this building at this time, the topic will be Israel Today, the gathering of Israel, including the challenges and the problems of the modern country of Israel, and also concerning the gathering to covenant Israel, which of course would be to the true church. And then finally, the last of these four, Sunday, December 6th, the title, Israel Tomorrow, the Prophetic Future of Israel, including events leading up to the next coming of the Messiah. But I believe that we as Latter-day Saints know more about Israel than any other people on the face of the earth. I honestly, sincerely believe that. I believe we know more about the origin, the history, the present circumstances, and the prophetic future of Israel than any other people, including the Jewish people themselves. And therefore, I'm hoping that not only might we, individually and as a group, learn something during these discussions, but also that we might be able to meet with some of our Jewish friends and discuss these things with them. We have access to everything they have concerning the histories of their people. We have copies of their Torah, the five books of Moses. We have the Old Testament. We have their commentaries and their histories. But in addition to that, we have modern scriptures that tell us a great deal about Israel. And we have living prophets who have told us a great deal about Israel. And if we have listened to the words of the living prophets, and if we have read the words of ancient prophets, then I submit that we as Latter-day Saints know more about the topic of Israel than anyone else. It's not that we want to take away any knowledge that they have or any understanding. It is simply that we want to add to it. I was hoping tonight to use a visual aid, and because we had had a certain printing company here do some printing for us, I was quite confident I could borrow that visual aid over the weekend, and so yesterday morning I called early to go over to pick it up, and then was shocked to find out that they were not open on Saturdays. I do have a visual aid, however, and I got it out of the encyclopedias that President Reynolds had there in the mission home, the World Book Encyclopedia. This is the 1975 edition, by the way. And I looked under the topic of printing in color and was reminded again of something that I learned when I was a graduate student at Indiana University working on a doctor's degree in communications and when we had to do a lot of photographing both in motion picture and also in steel and in uh, television production. And that has to do with what we call color separations. Under color engravings, I read the following in this book. To reproduce full color copy, the photo engraver photographs the copy four times to get a separate negative of the red, yellow, blue, and black. Plates are made from the negatives. Each plate prints red, yellow, blue, or black. And then an explanation of this. By using only tiny dots of transparent red, blue, and yellow, and black ink, Process color printing can reproduce copy containing almost all the colors and tones of the rainbow. At least three printing plates must be made, one each to print red, blue, and yellow ink, and usually a black plate is also made because black ink adds sharpness to the printed illustration. And then they have a reproduction here of here's the apple as it looks in the book, and then, as it is shown when it runs through the yellow plate with the yellow print, and then the red, and then the blue, and then the black. Those of you who are close enough to see can see that each one of those, although they have certain details of the apple, 
Some of them you would have difficulty recognizing as it as an apple except for the outline until they are put together. And then all of a sudden, the image of the apple appears. What we as Latter-day Saints have, in a sense, is a series of overlays. We have the Old Testament account of the house of Israel. In a sense, it is the yellow printing. In addition to that, we have the Book of Mormon account of the, the apple, as it were, or of the house of Israel. It does not add anything new so far as shape or form is concerned, but it adds a great deal concerning detail. And then when we put the other overlay of the teachings of the modern prophets, then all of a sudden we start seeing the vivid colors pertaining to the house of Israel. And therefore, when we bring to bear on the topic of the house of Israel these additional overlays, these additional cover, colors, if you will, we do not subtract from the things that we already know or the things that we get from other sources, including the Bible. We do not want to take anything away from any truth that anybody has concerning this subject. But I do believe we do have some overlays that we can add to give additional dimensions. And therefore, tonight, I should like to share with you some of those overlays. Perhaps it's a throwback to the days when I used to do debating in college that I feel almost impelled to, first of all, define the terms that are used in this title. I will do it very quickly, and then I'm afraid I'm going to take considerable time to go back and do it over again in greater detail. The topic you recall again, the sticks of Judah and Joseph, two witnesses for the Messiah. The basic text, of course, of our talk tonight, most Latter-day Saints would quickly identify. It comes from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 15 through 20, which read as follows. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks wherein thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. We have in the writings of other ancient prophets, including the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 36 of the writings of that prophet, where the Lord commanded Jeremiah, Take thee a roll of a book and write therein. And then we read subsequently that Baruch, the scribe of Jeremiah, wrote upon the roll of the book. In ancient times, as many of you will know, in, instead of having books that open the way we have now that would lie flat and be page numbered, <clears throat> they had rolls papyri rolls, if you will. Sometimes they were leather skins, as we find out from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It would be almost a continuous record. And then this continuous record, this scroll or this roll, was placed around a stick. And evidently the Lord is commanding Ezekiel on this occasion to keep two records. One record for the tribe of Judah, or the people of Judah and his companions. Another record for the tribe of Joseph and his companions. There is no question among Latter-day Saint scholars and among the prophets and seers and revelators of this dispensation concerning the interpretation of these particular verses. Elder the Grand Richards, the oldest apostle on the earth today in, a, in terms of years, has written the following. In ancient times, in addition to keeping records on metal plates, it was the custom to write upon parchment, which was then rolled upon sticks for preservation. Thus, when Ezekiel was commanded by the Lord to take the one stick and write upon it for Judah, then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, in our present-day language, it was the equivalent of commanding the prophet to write one record for Judah and a separate record 
for Joseph. The keeping of these two records, the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph, was a very grave and important matter to the Lord. He commanded they be kept with the promise that he would join them together and make them one in his hand. We understand this to mean that when the stick of Joseph would be joined to the stick of Judah, it would have the same significance to the Jews as their record, the Old Testament, the stick of Judah, would have to the descendants of Joseph. In other words, they would be witnesses for each other. The stick of Judah would be a witness to those who would have the stick of Joseph, and the stick of Joseph would be a witness to those who have the stick of Judah. They would be two witnesses, but they would become one in the hand of the Lord in the sense that, and this is according to the writings of Joseph Fielding Smith, they would become one in prophecy, one in revelation, one in doctrine, one in ordinances, one in unfolding the purposes and designs of God, and in leading mankind to a knowledge of the truth. There would be two writings, one to Ephraim or Joseph and one to Judah, but they would be brought forth by the Lord and would become one in his hand. In addition to this, we have the statement in Articles of Faith by James E. Talmage, when we call to mind the ancient custom in the making of books, that of writing on large strips of parchment and rolling the same on rods or sticks, the use of the word stick as equivalent to book in the passage becomes apparent. Now, I have other documentation, if you'd care to receive that, on the difference to the interpretation of the word stick. If you look at it in the Hebrew language, the word could be translated several ways. It could have been translated wood, or it could have been translated uh, tree, for example. It's essentially the same word that was translated in Jeremiah chapter 36 as roll. But it's obvious that it's something that is to be written upon. Take the one stick and write upon it. Unfortunately, the King James translators, when they came to that part of the Hebrew text that they used in their translation, they evidently thought that the Lord was telling Ezekiel exactly what should be written on the sticks. And so in the King James Version, the punctuation is as follows. Take the one stick and write upon it, comma, capital F, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, as though those were to be the actual words that were to be inscribed on the, on the stick. Then take another stick and write upon it, comma, capital F, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Of course, the original text did not give that interpretation. This is an interpretation placed upon it by the King James scholars. The Lord here was not directing them as to the exact words that should be written on this occasion, those few words for, the, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, but rather it was to be a record that was to be preserved and made available to Judah and to his descendants and those associated with him. Well, perhaps so much for the statement on concerning the sticks, representing evidently a book or a record of some type upon which written material could be placed. Now, why are Judah and Joseph mentioned specifically? We are going to develop, a month from now, the origin and history of the house of Israel. We will probably begin with Adam, but very quickly we'll go to Abraham and quite quickly we will get to Israel, the ancient Jacob, the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. He was given the name Israel, as you recall, in the Old Testament account. Israel, or Jacob if you will, subsequently had twelve sons. Their names in the order of their birth are Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. In those days, as we will develop next month, these people had a practice called polygyny. It's not technically polygamy, which would allow either the husband to have more than one wife or the wife to have more than one husband, nor was it polyandry, where the wife could have more than one husband. Technically, they practiced polygyny, where the husband could have more than one wife. Jacob was a polygynist. He had more than one wife. Indeed, he had four wives. Their names, in the order of their marriage, and we will develop that in great detail next month, were Leah, the sister of Leah, called Rachel, Bilhah, a servant of Rachel, and Zilpah, a servant of Leah. 
And from those four wives came these twelve sons. They subsequently became known as the house of Israel collectively. Individually, they became known as the twelve blood tribes of Israel. Later, when the house of Israel came out of Egypt and came back into the promised land, there were certain land inheritances given to the descendants of ancient Israel. Only when we read of those tribal inheritances in the Old Testament, we find that not all twelve names are mentioned as receiving tribal inheritances. Indeed, Levi is specifically mentioned that he is not to have a tribal inheritance because his descendants were the priestly tribe. They held the Levitical priesthood. They were the deacons and the teachers in the church. And as today we could not have all of our deacons and teachers of all of our wards living in only one ward of the stake, they live in all of the wards. So in ancient times you could not have all of the Levite priests, if you will, living in one land area. So different cities were designated in all of the lands of the other tribes, and then the Levites lived in those cities. So there was no separate land inheritance given to Levi. But also there was no separate land inheritance given to Joseph which, according to the Old Testament customs and beliefs, is a very significant thing, because Joseph ends up with the birthright of Jacob. He ends up with that birthright by right of his birth. That's what the word means, the birthright. Because under the ancient customs of these people, they had a law or a custom called primogenitor, prime having to do with first, genitor having to do with birth. Primogenitor was that the firstborn son received a double portion of his father's inheritance, because upon the death of the father he became the new head of the family. These people practiced the patriarchal order, where the son would succeed the father as the head of the family. And so there would be no strife nor civil war among the brothers when the father died. The custom had developed that the firstborn son would take the place as the head of the family upon the death of the father. As a son, he received an inheritance equal to all of the other sons. As the firstborn son, he received a double portion of the father's inheritance because he is now responsible for the entire family. Any minor children who needed to be taken care of, any unmarried daughters in the family he was responsible for, and therefore he received a double portion. Reuben was the firstborn son of the first wife, but we read that Reuben committed adultery with one of his father's wives and lost the right to the birthright, and therefore the birthright went to the firstborn son of the second wife, Rachel, the mother of Joseph. And so Joseph ends up with the birthright of ancient Israel. However, after Joseph was sold into Egypt and after Jacob came down to live into Egypt, Jacob learns of the birth of two sons to Joseph. And next time we will read the patriarchal blessing that he gives to those two sons. Those two sons in the order of their birth were Manasseh and Ephraim. And in Genesis chapters 48, 49, and the first part of 50, it is made clear that Ephraim ends up with the birthright of Joseph, Joseph ends up with the birthright of Israel or Jacob, and therefore Ephraim ends up with the birthright of the house of Israel. And that's the significance, I think, of the statement of the Lord when he said in Ezekiel, you write the one record for Judah, and then you write the other record for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. See, only one name was mentioned for Judah, but two names are mentioned for the other stick, the name of Joseph and also the name of Ephraim. We have two accounts of Father's blessings by Jacob to his sons. One account appears in Genesis 49, the other account in Deuteronomy 33. It's very interesting to note the length of those blessings as well as the substance. In the blessing in chapter 49 of Genesis, Reuben has 47 words, Simeon 37, Levi 37, Judah 100, Dan 36, Naphtali 10, Gad 13, Asher 14, Issachar 36, Zebulun 25, Joseph 145, Benjamin 22. When we read the account under Deuteronomy, and this of course is when they were applying the priesthood laws among these people, we should not be surprised to find that this blessing of Levi was much longer than the earlier blessing. But it also is interesting to know that proportionately it's still Judah and Joseph who received the greater blessings. Reuben this time receiving only 13 words. Simeon is not even mentioned. 
Levi gets 119 words in that blessing. Judah gets 37. Dan gets 10. Naphtali, 20. Gad, 61. Asher, 37. Issachar, 22. Zebulun, 22. Joseph, 156. Benjamin, 28. When you read the accounts of these blessings, they are very interesting. I will refer only to the blessings given to Judah and Joseph, because these are the two tribes we are talking about. To Judah, the Lord says, he is a lion's whelp. He is to be praised by his brethren. The scepter is to remain with him. Lawgivers are to come forth from him. A great blessing indeed. To Joseph, Jacob pronounced, Joseph is a fruitful bough. Even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The orchards have surely sorely grieved him, and shot at him, and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors and to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Now, that's been a very difficult verse for a lot of people to understand, our series of verses. What is this land that was going to be given to Joseph for a tribal inheritance that would be in the land of the everlasting hills, where there would be blessings of the deep, blessings of the heaven above, blessings of the breast and of the womb, and that his blessing was to be separate from his brethren? In the account in Deuteronomy, chapter 33, we are given some additional information on this, because these are the words of the blessing to Joseph on that occasion. And of Joseph, Jacob said, Blessed of the Lord be his land, for the precious things of heaven, for the dew, and for the deep that coucheth beneath, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills, and for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph, and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh, indicating again the fact that they were to be a very fruitful, a very productive people. In fact, interestingly enough, the very name Ephraim in Hebrew means fruitful, and the very name Joseph means added upon. Now, where do we get these patriarchal blessings to Joseph that indicates that his land inheritance is to be separate from his brethren as he had been separated from them when he was sold into Egypt? We get them from the writings of Moses. In each of these accounts, at the beginning of these books that we are reading, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first book of Moses called Genesis, the second book of Moses called Exodus, etc., Moses is the person responsible to give us these patriarchal blessings. Who was the right-hand confidant of Moses during this period of time? Joshua. Who was responsible for assigning the tribal inheritances to the tribes of Israel? Joshua. Did Joshua know that Joseph was to receive his tribal inheritance apart from his brethren? Well, of course he did. And therefore, he does not designate a separate tribal land for Joseph. But in keeping with the custom that the birthright son is to receive a double portion of the father's inheritance, he designates tribal inheritances to the two sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, the only grandsons of Jacob so honored. And thus again we have twelve tribes, the twelve land tribes of Israel, but they are not the same as the twelve blood tribes. Ten of the twelve are the same leaving out Levi and Joseph from among the blood tribes and substituting the names of Manasseh and Ephraim from the land tribes. And therefore we have Joseph, the blood tribe, 
Ephraim, the land tribe. No wonder our Heavenly Father, in designating this record, wants to identify both of those, because the stick is to tell about those particular people. Later we read in First Chron- uh, Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1, Reuben was the firstborn of Israel, but as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And in Genesis chapter 48, verses 19 to 20, it reads, Truly Ephraim shall be greater than Manasseh, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And Israel, or Jacob, blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall I, Israel, bless thee, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he sat Ephraim before Manasseh. And so Ephraim ends up with the birthright of ancient Israel. Now, the next part of this statement then about the sticks of Judah and Joseph, also the stick of Ephraim, we read about two witnesses. We read about the fact that there's going to be one witness from Judah, one witness from Joseph, but they're going to become one in the hand of the Lord. The Lord has always worked according to a series of witnesses. Joseph Fielding Smith, our recent prophet, has written, There is a law definitely stated in the scriptures governing testimony and the appointment of witnesses. This law the Lord has always followed in granting new revelation to the people. All bound through the ages, this law has been a fixed and definite one. If we had perfect records of all ages, we would find that whenever the Lord has established a dispensation, there has been more than one witness to testify for him. As early as the book of Deuteronomy, we read, At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Later on, the Savior himself said, But he that will not hear of him, thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. In the Book of Mormon, we read in Ether chapter 5, verse 4, concerning the fact that even one of these scriptural witnesses for the divinity of Christ, the Book of Mormon, in turn would have a series of witnesses. And we know, of course, about the three witnesses, also the eight special witnesses, etc. And therefore, our Heavenly Father has provided for the world a series of scriptural witnesses. Tonight we are talking about portions of two of them. I don't believe we are talking about all of the stick of Judah, nor the stick of Joseph. I am quite confident that our present Bible is not the complete stick of Judah. And I am equally confident the stick of Joseph is not the complete stick of, the Book of Mormon is not the complete stick of Joseph. Indeed, we do not have in the church today a single complete scripture, not a single one. Certainly our Old Testament is not complete. There are at least 17 books referred to in the Old Testament that are not found in that record. The New Testament is not a complete book. Paul refers to other epistles that we do not have in our present record. Certainly the Book of Mormon is not a complete book. The major writer of the Book of Mormon, the man Mormon himself said, he did not write one hundredth part of what was written on the large plates of Nephi. And in that record, the Book of Mormon, we are promised that the time will come when the sealed portion of that record will be revealed. And therefore our present Book of Mormon is not a complete record. At best, we have an abridgment of the stick of Joseph. At best, we have an incomplete stick of Judah. But they are the best that we have, and they are the best that we deserve. And when I say they are the best that we deserve, it's because our Heavenly Father has told us how he works according to the giving of Scripture. In 2 Nephi chapter 28, when the Lord revealed to his prophet Nephi what he had in mind concerning these two witnesses, Among other things, he made this comment. Behold, thus saith the Lord God, I will give unto the children of men line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. And blessed are those who hearken unto my precepts and lend an ear unto my counsel, for they shall learn wisdom. For unto him that receiveth, I will give more. 
That's the way our Heavenly Father worked with us so far as Scripture is concerned. Oh, he has enough scriptures way up here if he wanted to give them to us. But in our reading, in our understanding, in our living the scriptures, we as a people are way down here. And if he should give us all of these scriptures and we do not read them, we do not understand them, we do not live them, then he, gives, he brings us under great condemnation because we will be judged not only according to what we do, but we will be judged according to what we do in proportion to what we have opportunity to do or what we know we should do. A loving, kind, heavenly Father doesn't deal with his children that way. Behold, thus saith the Lord God, I give unto the children of men line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, and blessed are those who lend an ear unto my counsel and hearken unto my precepts, for unto him that receiveth I will give more. So what determines or who determines how much scripture we have? We do. We determine that. Our Heavenly Father will give us as much as we are able to take. And therefore, as I say, we have the scriptures that we deserve. And at the present time, we have a series of incomplete scriptures. And therefore, although the overlays that we have might not be complete, they are complete enough with the red and the yellow and the blue and the black that we can see in rather great detail what is going to happen, what has happened, and what will yet happen on this earth. There's another overlay yet in the future, however. Perhaps it is the black one. It will be the one that will put in the final detail. We read about that in the very next chapter of Second Nephi, chapter 29. The Lord himself is speaking. I command all men, both in the east and in the west and in the north and in the south and in the isles of the sea, that they shall write the words which I speak unto them. For out of the books which shall be written, I will judge the world, every man, according to their works, according to that which is written. For behold, I shall speak unto the Jews, and they shall write it. That's the record of Judah, the stick of Judah, the Old Testament, if you will. And I shall also speak unto the Nephites, and they shall write it. The Nephites were descendants of Joseph, you remember, therefore their writings are part of the stick of Joseph. And I shall also speak unto the other tribes of the house of Israel, which I have led away, and they shall write it. Then later the Lord says, It shall come to pass that the Jews shall have the words of the Nephites, and the Nephites shall have the words of the Jews, and the Nephites and the Jews shall have the words of the lost tribes of Israel, and the lost tribes of Israel shall have the words of the Nephites and the Jews. So far, we as Latter-day Saints are the only ones that have the multiplicity of witnesses here. We have the stick of Judah, the Bible, the stick of Joseph, the Book of Mormon. There is a third overlay, if you will, yet to come forth. But before the third overlay comes forth, we must take to those who have the stick of Judah the record that we have, the stick of Joseph, the Book of Mormon. So those two can become one in the hand of the Lord. And then after those two become one in the hand of the Lord, then the Lord will bring forth the clinching witness, if you will, the confirming witness, the third witness, the record of the lost tribes of Israel. And I don't profess to know anything else that will be recorded in the record of the lost tribes of Israel, but I can promise you one thing that will be recorded in that record. There will be a testimony and a witness in that record that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God on this earth. Because the purpose of the scriptures is to testify concerning the Messiah. That's why in the Bible we have two records. Because it takes two records in order to testify of the divinity of Jesus in ancient times. Why? Because the proof of the divinity of Jesus Christ is his resurrection. If Jesus Christ is indeed resurrected from the dead, then he is the divine Son of God. So in order for a scripture to be a witness for the divinity of Christ, it must have proof of his resurrection. The Old Testament does not have that evidence and that testimony. Oh, there are many prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the resurrection of Christ, but there is no proof of his resurrection because the Old Testament was written hundreds of years before Christ was born. It's in the New Testament where we read of the resurrection of Christ and his subsequent appearances, etc. There is where we have the witness of the divinity of Christ. So the Old Testament and the New Testament make one witness. 
But in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every truth be established. Where is the second witness for the divinity of Christ scripturally? We as Latter-day Saints say it's the stick of Joseph, it's the Book of Mormon. Where will be the third witness of the divinity of Christ? It will come from the record of the lost tribes of Israel. And interestingly enough, this Book of Mormon indicates both of those things. Do you remember to have read, for example, in 3 Nephi chapter 11, that after the Savior was resurrected on the eastern continent, he came over here to the American continent, and then he appeared to the American continent, and he spoke to the people on that occasion. These are the Nephites who had uh, survived the great destruction. Among other things, in 3 Nephi chapter 11, he commanded those people, Arise and come forth unto me, that ye may thrust your hands into my side, and also that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth, and have been slain for the sins of the world. And it came to pass that the multitude went forth and thrust their hands into his side, and did feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. And this they did do going forth one by one until they had all gone forth, and did see with their eyes and did feel with their hands, and did know of a surety, and did bear record that it was he of whom it was written by the prophets that should come. And when they had all gone forth and had witnessed for themselves, they did cry out with one accord, saying, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Most High God. And they did fall down at the feet of Jesus and did worship him. And if the Book of Mormon ended right there, 3 Nephi chapter 11, verse 17, the Book of Mormon is a witness for the divinity of Christ because it has proof of his resurrection. That's the, perhaps the major reason why the resurrected Christ appeared to the descendants of Joseph. That perhaps is the major reason why he carried the march of the crucifixion with him when he appeared to them, so that they would know and would bear record and witness and testify that he was indeed resurrected from the dead because the proof of the divinity of Christ is that he was resurrected from the dead. Now, what do we know about the record of the lost tribes of Israel? Well, subsequently, the Savior gave a great sermon to these people. And then after he had given the sermon, he made this comment. He talked about the fact that there are other tribes who he, to whom he must appear. In fact, he said, when I was on the eastern continent among the Jewish people, I said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. The reference, of course, to John in the New Testament. But he goes on. And now because of stiff-neckedness and unbelief, they, that is the Jewish people, understood not my word. Therefore I was commanded to say no more of the Father concerning this thing unto them. Now, when he, therefore, there's all kinds of interesting speculation among biblical scholars, New Testament scholars, as to what the Savior meant when he said, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, and them also I must visit, that they might hear my voice, that there might be one fold and one shepherd. They think he is talking about the Gentiles in some of the commentaries, despite the fact that in Matthew it is specifically recorded where the Savior said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and therefore could not refer to the Gentiles. Who are these other lost sheep to whom the Savior must appear? In the Book of Mormon, when he appears to these people, he quotes that scripture, and then he says, Ye are they of whom I said, Other sheep I have which are not of this land. And then after telling them and identifying them as among those other lost sheep, then he makes this comment. And verily, verily, I say unto you, that I have other sheep, which are not of this land, the land of the Nephites, neither of the land of Jerusalem, the land of Judah, neither in any parts of that land round about whither I have been to minister. For they of whom I speak are they who have not as yet heard my voice, neither have I at any time manifested myself unto them. But I have received a commandment of the Father that I shall go unto them, and that they shall hear my voice, and shall be numbered among my sheep that there may be one fold and one shepherd, therefore I go to show myself unto them. See, that's why he's going to the lost tribes of Israel. He is not going primarily to teach them. They undoubtedly already have prophets, as the Nephites had. 
He is not going to them primarily to set the example. They undoubtedly had prophets as the Nephites did. The Nephite prophets, some of them were so righteous, they were, they were translated. Why did the Savior appear to the Nephites? So that they could bear witness that he is the God of Israel and has been slain for the sins of the world. So the Book of Mormon, the Stick of Joseph, would be a witness for the divinity of Christ. Why did he go to the lost tribes of Israel? I go to show myself unto them. And you might say, well, he didn't say the lost tribes of Israel, but let's see. Does he not in the next chapter, in verse, chapter 17, verse 4? But now I go unto the Father, and also to show myself unto the lost tribes of Israel, for they are not lost unto the Father, for he knoweth whither he hath taken them. And therefore, as I say, we know one thing about that scriptural record when it comes forth, this third witness, this third overlay, if you will, it will be the record that will come forth from the lost tribes of Israel. And when it comes forth, then we have the confirming, indeed, we have the sealing witness that Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God. I would hope and pray, my brothers and sisters, that when that great day comes, that those of us who are members of the church will not be as reluctant to accept the third scriptural witness as the Christian world was to accept the second. The ancient prophets recorded their reaction. A Bible? A Bible? We don't need a Bible. We already have a Bible. Wouldn't it be unfortunate if in that day there should be any Latter-day Saint who would say, another scripture, another Book of Mormon, we don't need another Book of Mormon. We already have a Book of Mormon. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every truth be established. There is no greater truth on this earth than that Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God. That's the very purpose of scriptures, is to testify that Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God, and therefore, should it seem strange, that God will produce at least three scriptural witnesses of the divinity of his Son. Now let's look at that word Messiah very briefly. The word Messiah in the Hebrew language literally means the anointed one. The Messiah is the anointed one. The name Christ does not appear in the Old Testament. The name Christ is a Greek term, which means the same as the Hebrew word Messiah. Therefore, when the New Testament talks about Christ, it's as though the Old Testament were talking about the Messiah, because it's identically the same concept, the anointed one. One vivid image that comes up when you put the overlay of the Book of Mormon on the overlay of the Bible is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. When you look at only the one, the yellow, if you will, you don't detect that because it's always talking about the Messiah who is in the future. And we never do read about the future in the Old Testament period. Indeed, these people go into a state of apostasy to such a degree that they do not even continue with prophets. The last book in our present Old Testament, the book of Malachi, was written well over 300 years before Christ was born. And therefore, we do not have the critical period from about 400 years before the time of Christ down to the coming of the birth of Christ. That is, we do not have that in the Bible. But when we put the overlay of the Book of Mormon, then the picture comes out. That is one of the grand and glorious keys revealed by the Book of Mormon that Jesus Christ is the Messiah of Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament writers knew a great deal about the coming of this Messiah. They knew, for example, that he was going to be of the loins of David, and so they had used the sacred title, Son of David, to refer to the Messiah. And whenever you see those words used consecutively, particularly when the word Son is capitalized, that is the sacred title for the Messiah, because the prophets anciently, Isaiah, Psalms, Jeremiah, said that the Messiah would be of the loins of David. They also knew he would be born of a virgin. We don't need take, to take time to read the Isaiah passages on that. They also knew he would be born of Bethlehem of Judea, Micah so foretold. We also know from the writings of Hosea that he would come forth out of Egypt. We also know from Isaiah chapter 9 that he would be reared in the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali, up in the area of the Galilee where Nazareth is located and Capernaum, etc., we also know from the writings of Isaiah and many other prophets, when the Messiah came, he would have power over the elements of the earth. And did not Jesus demonstrate that power when he took water and changed it into wine, when he took a few loaves and fishes and multiplied them and fed thousands, 
when he walked on the waters of the Sea of Galilee, when he commanded the waves to calm down and the winds to be still. The prophets also knew that he would have power over the physical body, that he would heal the sick, cause the blind to see, the lame to walk. Indeed, he brought the very dead back to life again. The ancient prophets also knew and quoted, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, that the Messiah would come riding into the streets of the holy city of Jerusalem, seated on the foal of an ass. No wonder Matthew records that triumphal e entry by saying that a very great multitude knelt before him and cried with a loud voice, Hosanna to the Son of David. Because the Jewish people, as a people, were about to receive their Messiah. Jesus Christ. But then one of the great tragedies of all scripture and of all history, a tragedy so great that Peter, as soon as he starts to write, warns us about this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, the way prophecies are received is because God reveals his mind or will through the power of the Holy Ghost to his prophet on the earth. And then the prophet speaks by the power of the Holy Ghost. And so what the prophet says is the mind and the will and the word of God himself. And therefore, because that's the way the prophecy is received, the prophecy can be interpreted only by the same power by which it is given, knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For, that is because, the prophecy came in old time not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter had seen what had happened to the Jewish people as a nation. Up to this point, as the common people, Luke tells us, John tells us, Matthew and Mark all tell us, the common people heard Jesus gladly. His enemies were among the apostate religious leaders. They were among the civil leaders who saw in him a threat to their power and authority over the people. But the common people heard him gladly. Why did the common people finally turn against him? Someday I hope we'll have the opportunity to talk about the greatest week in history, the last week of the life of Christ, to see this great drama unfold. But very briefly here, the reason they finally turned against him is because they misunderstood at least two prophecies pertaining to their Messiah. Because in addition to the prophecies that we have enumerated, the ancient prophets had also said, the Messiah will lead the armies of Israel to victory over their enemies, and he would establish a great kingdom of peace and righteousness upon the earth, and he would subject all other kingdoms to his kingdom. And the Jewish people with these voluminous prophecies before them and then they saw this Jesus of Nazareth, who had been born in Bethlehem, come forth out of Egypt, etc., demonstrating all of this power, bringing the very dead back to life again. They're all ready to accept him as the Messiah. And then as his enemies, the enemies of Jesus, saw this, those devastating questions they asked, tell us whether thou be the king of the Jews. And his truthful answer, in the sense that it was given, my kingdom is not of this world. But then the wrong interpretation by the Jewish people, he is not going to establish a kingdom. That trick question, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Knowing that if he answered directly yes, he would lose all the support of the common people who believed that he was the Messiah and was going to subject all kingdoms, including that of Rome, to him. If he answered no, then immediately he could have been taken for trial before the Roman tribunal for the most serious crime under Roman law, treason. Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or no? And although he answered the question correctly, he did not answer it directly. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. But in the minds of those of private interpretation, he is not the Messiah after all. If he were the Messiah, he would not say, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. They placed personal interpretation upon the prophecies. They did not realize the Messiah is going to come twice. It's the first time when he comes to the earth that he's the babe of Bethlehem, the boy of Nazareth, the man of Jerusalem. It's the second time when he comes, when he will be king of kings and lord of lords. And because the Jewish people expected him to do at his first coming, everything that it was prophesied that he would eventually do, and when he didn't accomplish all of those things at his first coming, 
Then in their private interpretation, they rejected him as the Messiah. And because they, in their frustration, felt that he, this person in whom they had placed their fondest hopes, had betrayed them, they therefore agreed to betray him. And within the week, the cries are no longer Hosanna to the son of David. The cries are crucify him, away with him. And thus the Jewish people as a nation lost the chance in those days to accept their Messiah. Now I say as a nation because there are many of them as individuals who did accept. All of the apostles, as far as we know, were of the loins of Jacob. They were all Israelites. Nearly all of the early converts to the church, in fact, so far as we know, until the conversion of Cornelius, why all of the converts to the church came from among the Jewish people. Maybe a little bit of a misnomer when we say Jewish. They were really Israelites, but that will be in the discussion a month from now. Now, the Book of Mormon, interestingly enough, in its overlay, it substantiates all of these prophecies concerning the coming of the Messiah. But the Book of Mormon prophets also knew that the Jewish people would reject Christ when he came. When Jacob, the brother of Nephi, tried to explain this to the people, they couldn't believe it. They said, why will they not accept him? He will fulfill all of their prophecies. Why will they not accept him? And Jacob says, because of their blindness and their stiff nakedness, they will shoot beyond the mark. That is, they will expect him to do at his first coming everything that is prophesied that he will eventually do, not realizing he's going to come twice. It's the second time when he will fulfill part of their prophecies, and therefore they will shoot beyond the mark. And therefore, because of that tra tragic error of private interpretation, for 2,000 years, the Jewish people, as a people, have not recognized Jesus Christ as their long-awaited Messiah. In the meantime, interestingly enough, the Book of Mormon provides us with some additional witnesses of his birth. They are not mentioned in the Bible directly. They are certainly implied. Let me give you two examples. The Book of Mormon prophets also testified that there would be a new star in the eastern heavens when the Messiah was born. Did you realize that that is not in any of the biblical prophecies? Have you wondered why it was that the wise men came to find where Jesus had been born? We have followed his star from the east. Where did they get the idea that there was a new star to be given as a sign of the birth of the king of Israel? It does not appear in any Old Testament text. It did appear in the Book of Mormon text. Another very interesting thing, and by the way, this if you understand the beliefs and customs and practices and traditions of ancient Israel, when you read the New Testament, you learn almost as much by what is not stated as you do by what is stated. Now, if that sounds a little bit contradictory, let me give you an example concerning baptism. Did you know, for example, that the New Testament very clearly and definitely teaches that the Jewish people were practicing baptism at the time of Jesus? Now, some of our missionaries might say, well, boy, why didn't you give us that scripture? Because we could use that. Because there's, we've never found a chapter or a verse in the New Testament where it says that the time of Jesus, the Jewish people were practicing baptism. And it's true, in the King James Version, you cannot find such a verse. If you would let me use some of the other versions, including the Joseph Smith translation, I could read such a verse for you. For example, if you'd let me go to the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew chapter 9, I think it is, verse 7, I believe it is verse 7, we read these, in no, verse 17 and following, we read these intriguing words. Then said the Pharisees unto Jesus, Why will ye not receive us with our baptism, seeing we keep the whole law? But Jesus said unto them, Ye keep not the law. If ye had kept the law, ye would have received me, for I am he who gave the law. I receive not you with your baptism, because it profiteth you nothing. For when that which is new is come, the old is ready to be put away. So if we had that scripture in the Bible, we could quote it and say this proves that the Jewish people were practicing baptism at the time of Christ. But it does not appear in our Bible. There are reasons why it did not appear. Because later on, when Judaism and Christianity became very bitter enemies to each other, they didn't want anything in their scriptural records that would show a connection between the two. And because baptism had become recognized as a Christian ordinance, any reference to baptism in the Jewish scriptures were deleted. And we can document some of those deletions. Then how can we teach from the present New Testament 
that the Jewish people were practicing baptism at the time of Christ by this very simple method. Jesus Christ was a Jew. He and his parents, his mother Mary and his foster father Joseph, observed the practices, the customs, the traditions of Judaism. We could document that very carefully. Jesus was circumcised at the age of eight days. His mother presented herself at the temple for the cleansing ceremony that Jewish people, women, went through when they had their firstborn. See, they also sacrificed the two doves, which Jewish families will do when they have their firstborn son. They bring the boy back to the temple to become a son of the covenant at the age of 12 for his bar mitzvah. He does not begin his ministry until age 30. All of these things according to Jewish practice, custom, and tradition. Indeed, when Jesus ever deviated from those practices, when he did anything that was not necessary, or when he failed to do something that was necessary, he was severely criticized by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. Are those not true statements? If you accept those statements, then you accept the belief that the Jewish people were practicing baptism at the time of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was baptized, and where is there a single word of criticism in the New Testament concerning the baptism of Jesus? Whenever Jesus did anything that was not required, or when he failed to do something that was required, he was severely criticized by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. When Jesus was baptized, where is there a single word of criticism? There is not a single word. What does that prove? The Jewish people were practicing baptism at the time of Jesus. And if the scholars had recognized that, they would not have been as astonished when the Dead Sea Scrolls came forth some 30 years ago and proved conclusively that the Israelites were practicing baptism in the days of Jesus. The Israelites had a practice or custom of having 12 special witnesses for their work. How do we know that? Because the Savior called 12 special witnesses of his work. And where is there a word of criticism in the New Testament concerning the calling of the 12? There is not a single word. Where is there a single word of criticism concerning the fact that Jesus Christ appointed three of those 12 to have special dispensation, special gifts over the others. There is not a single word. What does that indicate? These were the practices, the customs, the traditions of Judaism. If the scholars had recognized that, they would not have been so surprised when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and when they translated the Manual of Discipline and found out that there were 12 men who presided over that community and there were three men who presided over the 12. You can learn almost as much by what is not mentioned in the Bible, as you can by reading what is in the Bible, if you know the practices and customs and traditions of those people. All of this to prove one thing. The Jewish people also knew that the mother of Jesus was to be called Mary. Oh, the Book of Mormon prophets, when we put that overlay on the Book of Mormon, we read that. In Mosiah chapter 3, verse 8, King Benjamin said, The things which I shall tell you are made known unto me by an angel from God. And then he tells about the birth of the Messiah and says, And his mother shall be called Mary. Or Alma the Younger, in Alma chapter 7, verse 10, he says, The Spirit hath said this unto me, His mother shall be called Mary. How do you know from the New Testament that the Jewish people knew that? Can you even think of a family that you meet in the four Gospels that does not have a Mary in that family? Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of James and John. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, the sister of Martha. In fact, in one time, the scripture simply gives up and says, and the other Mary. Now, knowing the belief, now put yourself back. As a good Orthodox Jewish family, you have all of these signs. I think they knew the time of his birth. The Book of Mormon prophets knew it. Over 500 years it was revealed to them, the exact year in which he would be born. What would you do if you had been an Orthodox Jewish person looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, and you knew the mother was going to be called Mary, and you and your wife, some 30 years before the sign was to be given, you and your wife were blessed with a little baby girl. I wonder what you would have named her. See, it's very interesting sometimes when you read of these customs, practices, and traditions 
and then test them against the New Testament. It's almost like you're bringing in the black printing. The black printing is not absolutely necessary. The red, the yellow, the blue, that's sufficient to give you the outline, to reproduce all of the colors. But the black sometimes provides the detail. And when you put the overlay of the witness of the Book of Mormon to these other testimonies, then it becomes a very strong witness. Well, now let me talk about two or three, maybe more than that, grand and glorious keys of understanding the scriptures pertaining to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. One of them is this. The word God in the Bible is not a name. It is a title. It is not a name. It does not necessarily refer to one specific person. Indeed, the word God in the King James translation is taken from the Hebrew word Elohim, which should not be translated God at all. El being the word for God, O simply a guide sound, and Him the plural. Elohim is the plural word for God in the Hebrew. And therefore, in the book of Genesis, for example, where we read, and God said, the correct reading as revealed in the Pearl of Great Price is, and the gods said. But later on in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt among a group of people who were polytheistic, they had all kinds of gods, their God Jehovah said, you don't have any other gods except me. And that's where the concept of the one God only idea came into ancient Israel. It was not there that there's only one God, but among these polytheistic people into, among whom the Israelites were living, they were to have only the one God, not all of these other pagan gods. And therefore, in some of the translations of the Bible, it says, and God said, rather than, and the gods said. But, those pronouns are rather sticky because you can't very well change the number of the pronouns in that verse. And therefore, notice the inconsistency in our present text. And God said, let us make man in our own image. We could repeat this time after time. The Savior in the book of John, John records, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, indicating two. How can he be with God unless there are two? Or in the book of Moses, the Lord says, I, the Lord God, said unto mine only begotten. How could he speak to his only begotten unless they were two? Or we could go in scripture after scripture, in Isaiah, for example. Surely he hath borne our griefs and been smitten of God. How could a person be smitten of himself if there is only one? Or let's take another reference from Isaiah. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. God shall bear a son to people. The word God in the Old Testament is not singular. It is not a name. It is a title. And that's what the overlay of the Book of Mormon makes clear when you place it on top. And you have to understand that in order to understand the next grand and glorious key. Jesus Christ of the New Testament is the same God as Jehovah of the Old Testament. And boy, that is where the overlay just leaps right up at you. Because this is something that many Christians and all Jews virtually have not seen before. Jesus Christ of the New Testament is the same God as Jehovah of the Old Testament. And the Book of Mormon proves this conclusively. How? Because the Book of Mormon provides us with 400 years of history immediately before the birth of Christ that is not provided for us in the Old Testament account. And then there we read what ancient Israel did. They were given the law of Moses. Why? to prepare for the coming of Christ. They kept the law of Moses, realizing that eventually the law would be dead unto them, that is, it would not have the saving power, because Christ himself would come. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is identically the same personage as Jesus Christ of the New Testament. The essential difference is, in the Old Testament, he is the pre-earthly Jehovah, that is, he is the pre-earthly Christ. He had not yet come on the earth and taken upon himself flesh. 
And thus in the Book of Mormon we read some of these evidences concerning the fact that he would come and take upon himself flesh. In fact, in 1 Nephi chapter 19, when Nephi had his great vision concerning the God of Israel, he said, The very God of Israel cometh, and the world shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore they scourge him, and he suffereth it. And they smite him, and he suffereth it. Yea, they spit upon him, and he suffereth it. And the God of our fathers, who were led out of Egypt, out of bondage, and also were preserved in the wilderness by him, yea, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, yieldeth himself, according to the words of the angel, as a man, into the hands of wicked men, to be lifted up, according to the words of Zenos, Zenoch, and to be crucified, according to the words of Nehem, and to be buried in a sepulcher, according to the words of Zenos. And then later, King Benjamin speaking, And he said unto me, the angel, Awake and hear the words which I shall teach thee. For behold, I am come to declare unto you the glad tidings of great joy. For the Lord hath heard thy prayers, and hath judged of thy righteousness, and hath sent me to declare unto thee that thou mayest rejoice, and that thou mayest declare unto thy people that they may also be filled with joy. And this is the great message that the angel delivered to King Benjamin that should be glad tidings to all mankind. For behold, the time cometh, and is not far distant, that with power the Lord God omnipotent who reigneth, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity, shall come down from heaven among the children of men, and shall dwell in a tabernacle of clay, and shall go forth amongst men working mighty miracles, such as healing the sick, raising the dead, causing the lame to walk, the blind to receive their sight, and the deaf to hear, and curing all manner of diseases. And he shall cast out devils, or the evil spirits, which dwell in the hearts of the children of men. And lo, he shall suffer temptations and pain of body, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, even more than man could suffer, except it be unto death. For behold, blood cometh from every poor, so great shall be his anguish for the wickedness and the abominations of his people." And he shall be called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the creator of all things from the beginning, and his mother shall be called Mary. See, the beautiful truth of the Book of Mormon that, just, that leaps out of the pages of the Bible once you see it is that Jesus Christ of the New Testament is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Now, because the Jewish people have not understood that, they have taken some scriptures to try to make these prove that they do not need a Redeemer or a Savior. But now you have the overlay there, and you can see the additional colors. These scriptures prove the exact opposite. Let me read one or two for you. Isaiah chapter 43. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Now see, if you read that from the background, that there's no connection between the Jehovah of the Old Testament and Jesus Christ of the New Testament, you could get the idea that there's not going to be a Savior. You don't need any Savior because I am your God. But when you put the overlay of the Book of Mormon, what he is saying, you don't need any other Savior other than me because I, your God, am your Savior. And all of a sudden, the writings of Isaiah start to make sense. I could read others, Isaiah chapter 45, Isaiah chapter 43, 44, and all of those he talks about the same principle. Another grand and glorious key, and we won't take time to go into this in greater detail, we've already mentioned it, the Messiah of Israel has already come to the earth. And when he came to the earth, he appeared both to the descendants of Judah, as recorded in the New Testament, the stick of Judah, by the way, the New Testament cannot qualify as the stick of Joseph. Some of the Bible commentaries would like to have you believe that Ezekiel 37 is fulfilled in the New Testament. The New Testament is the stick of Joseph, and the Old Testament is the stick of Judah. That is not possible. What is the New Testament about? 
Jesus of Nazareth. Who was Jesus of Nazareth? The son of David. Who was David? Of the loins of Judah. The New Testament cannot be the stick of Joseph because it tells about Judah. And so it's in the New Testament where we read about Jehovah, the Messiah, appearing to the people of Judah. But also he appeared to the descendants of Joseph as recorded in the Book of Mormon. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is the prophet like unto Moses. He specifically referred to himself as a prophet like unto Moses because that would have special significance for the descendants of Judah. And when you compare the life, the life, the the lives of these two great prophets, because Christ was a prophet. He was much more than a prophet, but he was a prophet. He was one who spoke for God. And when you compare the lives of those two great prophets, Moses and the Messiah, Jesus Christ, they are strikingly similar. Both talked with God face to face. The lives of both of them were sought in their infancy. Both of them demonstrated power over physical elements. Moses parting the waters of the sea, the Savior walking on them, commanding them to calm down. Both were subject to the powers of transfiguration. Moses at the end, the Savior on the Mount of Transfiguration. The families of each of them sometimes opposed them. We have good demonstration of that. They were both meek. They both rejected the glory of the world, etc., etc. But then now another grand and glorious key from the Book of Mormon. The Messiah Jesus Christ is yet to come the second time. To the Jewish people, perhaps the first time, although in the 2,000 years they have become largely disillusioned because when they saw all of these other prophecies fulfilled and then no fruition according to their interpretation, they have almost ceased to look for the Messiah. Many of them still do. And at the time of the Pesach this coming year, at the time of their Passover feast, their Seder feast, most Jewish people, at least the Orthodox, will have an empty plate at the table for Elijah the prophet. Why? Because Malachi, or Malachi as we would say it, their great prophet Malachi prophesied that before the coming of the Messiah that Elijah the prophet would be sent. I think one of the great ironies of history will be when the Jewish people find out how that prophecy was fulfilled. Where they get the idea that he was going to come at the time of the Passover, I do not know. It certainly is not in our Old Testament at the present time. But this is one of those very interesting customs, beliefs, and traditions which the Jewish people perpetuated evidently from time immemorial that Elijah the prophet would return to the earth at the time of the Passover season. And as I say, one of the great ironies of history will be when the Jewish people find out that on April 3, 1836, the first day of the Passover season of that year, at the very moment when the Jewish people in Jerusalem, because of the time differential between Jerusalem, Israel, and Kirtland, Ohio, at the very moment they were sitting down to their center feast in Jerusalem, leaving their door open and the empty plate, hoping that Elijah would come. He came. But not to them. To the descendant of Ephraim, Joseph Smith. Why? Because of a great eternal law, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And anciently, these two major divisions in Israel, the kingdom of Israel, headed by Ephraimites, the kingdom of Judah, headed by descendants of Judah. And so the descendants of Judah were given their opportunity and they rejected it finally. As a nation, again, not as individuals, many of them, but as a nation they rejected it. And therefore, according to this great eternal law, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. In this dispensation, the keys will be taken first of all to the descendants of Joseph. And then after they have had opportunity to accept, then it will be taken to the descendants of Judah. We will have more to say about that in two or three months when we talk about the Israel, the gathering of Israel in the last days. Now in conclusion, my brothers and sisters, may I make one other comment. And this this might sound a little bit strange to some of you because I, I don't believe it's what we always hear from the pulpit. It's one of the uh, scriptures that I would like to have us look at again. Some of us look at the scripture and we sort of uh, get an idea as to what it says, or maybe even more, we already have an idea as to what it says before we read it. And therefore, because we are preconditioned, we don't see what the scripture really says. That's our problem with the New Testament. I dare say that most of us, 
read the New Testament from a prejudiced viewpoint. That is, I'm not using the word in a negative sense. I'm using it according to the original definition. Prejudiced, you have made some prejudgments. Didn't you know how the New Testament was going to turn out before you started to read it? Oh, I believe so. I believe you know, you knew before you even read the first word in the New Testament that eventually the Jewish people were going to say, crucify him, away with him. And so all the way through when you read the New Testament, you see all of the hints and suggestions that would indicate that eventually they're going to reject him. And you overlook all of the hints and indications as to how close they came to accepting him as the Messiah. Do you remember the writings of Luke? When the Savior was up in the Galilee, the people who flocked to be near him were so numerous, they could not be numbered. Or the writings of Luke, when he said they were so numerous, there was not even room for them to stand on their own feet. They trod one upon the other in order to be near him and to hear him. Oh, if we stop and think, we remember on one occasion he got on a boat to preach to them from the sea because of the press of the multitude. We know because of some miracles he performed. On another occasion, 4,000 and still another 5,000 followed him for three days without anything to eat until finally, out of compassion, he took a few loaves and fishes and multiplied them and fed the thousands. Why? Because they believed that he was the Messiah. But see, when we read the New Testament, we don't see that. We don't see how closely they came to accepting him as the Messiah because we already know they're going to reject him. It's not too unlike, I guess, reading a mystery book. You know, if a mystery book is well written, a whodunit, you don't find out until the last page who really did it. Let's assume sometimes you want to take a short circuit and you turn to the last page first and you find out it indeed was the butler who did it. Now, that's a quick way to find out, but it ruins the story, I can guarantee you. After you know the butler did it, then you go back and start reading the first of the book. Any little hint that would suggest it might be anyone else you discount in your mind. You don't pay any attention to it. Well, of course, it's not the maid. She didn't have the key to the gun cabinet. Of course, it's not the chauffeur. He had the night off, see? You make all of these prejudgments. You've already determined how it's going to turn out. Some of us do that so far as Scripture. Someday I would like to discuss with you the Scriptures to ponder. Some Scriptures that appear to say one thing, but they do not say that at all. And interestingly enough, Some of those scriptures are our most widely quoted scriptures. And the reason our minds turn off when we see the scripture is because we have already decided or we have heard what the scripture says. And therefore, when we read it, we do not see what it says. The one example I will give tonight, probably the most frequently quoted scripture in the Book of Mormon. Let's try this just as a test. Everything considered, missionary work, gospel doctrine classes, everything, what do you suspect is the most frequently quoted scripture in the Book of Mormon? What one do you think it would be? Moroni 10 and 4? I submit that Moroni 10 and 4 is the most frequently misquoted scripture in the Book of Mormon. What does Moroni 10 and 4 say? Oh, I've heard it from pulpits. I've heard it in classrooms. We all know what Moroni 10 and 4 says. I'll paraphrase it. But doesn't Moroni 10 and 4 say that if you want to find out whether or not the Book of Mormon is true, you should read the Book of Mormon and there, with real intent, having faith in Christ, and then you ask God whether or not the Book of Mormon is true, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, our Heavenly Father will reveal the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon unto you. Isn't that what Moroni 10 and 4 says? Moroni 10 and 4 says no such thing. The word read does not even appear in Moroni 10 and 4. There's no way you can understand Moroni 10 and 4 unless you understand Moroni 10 and 3 and unless you complete it with Moroni 10 and 5 because in Moroni 10 and 4 there are some pronouns used, some words of reference. Unless you know what those words mean, then you don't know what the verse means. And what do the words mean? Well, let's read it in context. I can always find this scripture quite easily. It's the last page of the Book of Mormon. So that helps to find it. Moroni chapter 10, verse 4. The last chapter at least. Let's start reading with verse 3 this time. In connection with what we're talking now about the Bible for a moment. In verse 2 he says, I seal up these records, talking about the Book of Mormon records, after I've spoken a few words by way of exhortation unto you. Behold, I would exhort you 
that when you shall read these things, this is Moroni 10 and 3, when you read, and what are these things? Well, the only antecedent are the records of the Book of Mormon. So in Moroni 10 and 3, we are to read the Book of Mormon, the records of the Book of Mormon, if it be wisdom in God that ye should read them, that ye would remember how merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of men from the creation of Adam, even down unto the time that ye shall receive these things, and ponder it in your hearts. Now, I didn't do a very good job of reading that, but if I had done a better job, all of a sudden you would have seen there are about three things you have to do in Moroni 10 and 3. You have to read the Book of Mormon, you have to read the Bible, you have to see how God deals with men on the earth, and you must ponder these things in your heart. You must ponder the way God deals with men in your heart. Oh, you might say, where does it say Bible? The word Bible does not appear there, and that is true. But let's see what it did say. When ye shall read these things, if it be wisdom in God that ye should read them, that ye would remember how merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of man from the creation of Adam, even down unto the time that ye shall receive these things, and ponder it in your hearts. Where do you read about the creation and of the story of the earth from Adam down to this time? In the Bible. It is not in the Book of Mormon. Indeed, this very writer, Moroni, when he started to write his record in Ether chapter 1, he says, And as I suppose that the first part of this record, which speaks concerning the creation of the world and also of Adam, is had among the Jews, therefore I do not write those things which transpired from the days of Adam until that time. So what must you do in Moroni chapter 10 verse 3? You must read the Book of Mormon. You must read the Bible. The Book of Mormon is a witness for the Bible. You must compare these two records. If this is the way God dealt with people in Old Testament times, is it possible that he could have dealt with these people in Book of Mormon times? You ponder it in your hearts. Now we finally come to Moroni 10 and 4. Let me read it through without interpretation. Stop me when I say the word read. And when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God the Eternal Father in the name of Christ, if these things are not true, and if he shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. What's the antecedent of these things in verse 4? It's entirely different than the antecedent in verse 3. These things in verse 3 refers back to verse 2. These things in verse 4 refers back to verses 3 and 2. So what must you be willing to receive? You must be willing to receive the Bible. You must be willing to receive the Book of Mormon. You must be willing to receive the way God deals with men on the earth. If you're willing to receive, not read, there's a world of difference. You can read and not receive. But if you're willing to receive those things, then you go and ask God in the name of Christ whether or not those things are true. And then he reveals the truth of it, singular, the Book of Mormon, unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. Maybe we have expected too much of the Book of Mormon. After all, the Book of Mormon is over only an overlay in and of itself. It only provides us with the red, if you will. The Bible supplies us with the yellow. And so you can look at the Book of Mormon and get an incomplete picture too because it's dealing with only one branch of the house of Israel. You can read the Bible and get an incomplete picture. It's where you put the two of them together that you get the true picture. These books are witnesses for each other. They are intended to be studied together. One of the most, again, misquoted and misread verses in the Book of Mormon comes from the writings of the man whose name appears on the front of this book, the prophet Mormon himself. Let's turn to the very last chapter that he wrote. Mormon chapter 7, in the small book of Mormon here, this is on page 471. Chronologically, these are the last writings of Mormon. Indeed, in Mormon chapter 8 it says, I am Rhodi who finished the record of my father Mormon. My father has been killed by the Lamanites, and so on. So chapter 7 is the last writing of Mormon on this earth. Notice what he says in verse 8. Therefore repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, and lay hold upon the gospel of Christ, which shall be set before you, not only in this record, let's see, what record are we talking about when he uses the word this? 
the Book of Mormon, believed the Bible, which is written not only in this record, the Book of Mormon, but also in the record which shall come unto the Gentiles from the Jews. Which record shall come from the Gentiles unto you? Now, what is the name of that scripture which went from the Jewish people to the Gentiles to the American Indian, the descendants of Mormon? What is the name of that record? The Bible. So now that we know that the word this refers to the Book of Mormon and the word that refers to the Bible, notice the power of the subsequent verse. For behold, this is written for the intent that ye may believe that. Why did Mormon write the Book of Mormon? So you would believe the Bible. How can you believe the Bible unless you read it? How can you believe the Book of Mormon unless you read it? The Book of Mormon was written for the intent that ye may believe that. And then, the dynamite. And if ye believe that, ye will believe this also. Once you see the two overlays, you cannot place one upon the other regardless of which one you begin with. You cannot put the overlay on top of the other without recognizing that they teach the same thing. They have become one in the hand of the Lord as the Lord told his ancient prophet Ezekiel. Brigham Young bears the same testimony that Mormon bore. No man can say that the Bible is true and at the same time say the Book of Mormon is untrue. There is not that man nor woman on the face of this earth who has had the privilege of studying the gospel of Jesus Christ from these two books that can say that one is true and the other is false. If one be true, both are. Why? Because they both testify of the same thing. Jesus Christ of the New Testament is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He is the divine Son of God on the earth. These ancient prophets, both in Old Testament times and New Testament times, were commanded to keep these records. And we who have been given the opportunity to read these records, we are going to be held accountable as to whether or not we read them. Let me conclude with the words of Nephi as he concluded his record. And now, my beloved brethren, and also unto you and all ye ends of the earth, hearken unto these words and believe in Christ. And if ye believe not in these words, believe in Christ. And if ye shall believe in Christ, ye will believe in these words, for they are the words of Christ. And he hath given them unto me, and they teach all men that they should do good. And if they are not the words of Christ, judge ye. For Christ will show unto you with power and great glory that they are his words at the last day. And you and I shall stand face to face before his bar. And ye shall know that I have been commanded of him to write these things, notwithstanding my weakness. And I pray the Father in the name of Christ that many of us, if not all, may be saved in his kingdom at that great and last day. And now, my beloved brethren, all those who are of the house of Israel, and all ye ends of the earth. I speak unto you as the voice of one crying from the dust, Farewell until that great day shall come. And you that will not partake of the goodness of God and respect the words of the Jews, the stick of Judah, the Old Testament, and also my words, the stick of Joseph, the Book of Mormon, and the words which shall proceed forth out of the mouth of the Lamb of God, the remainder of the stick of Judah, the New Testament, behold, I bid you an everlasting farewell. For these words will condemn you at the last day. For what I seal on earth shall be brought against you at the judgment bar. For thus hath the Lord commanded me, and I must obey. My prayer, my brothers and sisters, is when we face Nephi and the other prophets, Old Testament and Book of Mormon prophets at that judgment bar, and when we are told by the Savior, I commanded these men to write these words so they would testify of me, did you have opportunity to read them while you were on the earth? 
And of course, every one of us in this room, whether a member of the church or not, we must answer honestly, as all man, men must, and we must say, yes, we had opportunity. Did you read them? Did you learn the great principles contained in them? Did you exercise faith in me as the Messiah? Did you live according to the teachings of those scriptures? Did you apply the principles in your life and did you teach them to your children and help them to apply them in their lives? Can you imagine the feeling we must have on that occasion if we say, yes, I had opportunity, but then we say, no, I did not read, no, I did not understand, no, I did not live, no, I did not teach. That each of us may honestly say, yes, I had opportunity, and yes, I did read, yes, I did understand, yes, I did live, yes, I did teach. And then hopefully we'll hear the words, those gladsome words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That such might be the case for each of us, I pray for all of us. In his holy name, Jesus Christ, amen.